Hello and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn, and today we are filming live from Denver, Colorado. I guess we always film live, <laughs> but you're not listening live or watching live. But we're here in the home of uh, uh, someone who's become a dear friend of mine. His name is Eldon Karchner. Uh, I met Eldon when I attended the uh, Denver Mormon Stories Conference a few months back in 2012. But uh, but Eldon's been a longtime listener of Mormon Stories. And while I was here in Denver, uh, I got a sense for his story. And I knew that we needed to interview him. This is the first uh, video interview that we've ever conducted outside of uh, the state of Utah. So I actually flew back here to Denver to interview Eldon, and it's because I just, uh, the story is so interesting, and there's so many people involved uh, that that I felt like it warranted a a video interview and uh, higher quality audio. Um, Just to give you a little bit of a sense or preview of what um, Eldon's story is about, Um, Eldon grew up devout LDS in, uh, in Arizona, of Pioneer Stock. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, a very um, strong and uh, significant family in in the part of Arizona where he grew up in. Um, he, uh, he experienced same-sex attraction as, uh, as a teenager and, and as a young adult. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about that. That's not necessarily the centerpiece of the story, but it's an important theme that runs through uh, throughout the story, uh, he attended BYU, where he's where he uh, where he worked as a young ambassador, so a singer and a dancer for BYU. And and while he's at BYU, he also um, experienced what we call in in the field of psychology reparative therapy, which is the therapy you receive or or people used to administer. They don't do it so much anymore to try and change your sexual orientation. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, then, then we're going to talk about his leaving BYU, moving here to Denver, where as a, as a gay Mormon male, he, he met the woman of his dreams, Heather, and they fell in love and got married and had three beautiful children. And, um, and for those of you who are familiar with the Josh Weed you know, blog post in 2012 where a, a gay Mormon male came out as 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 being the father of, uh, of three children and, and as having a 10 year marriage that for him and, and Lolly has worked really well. We're going to be talking in depth about, um, Eldon's experience in, in what's called a mixed orientation marriage and how he and Heather made that a work. And I think you'll find that it worked very well for them. Um, so Eldon's going to talk about that, but he's also going to talk about why he would never recommend it to anybody else. So that's um, going to be an important part of, of this discussion. And then we're going to talk about um, uh, his, his wife, who, Heather, who contracted cancer and, um, and her battle with cancer, again, with three young children and eventually um, her passing away. And so we're going to talk about dealing with cancer, dealing with uh, the loss of a loved one, dealing with grief. Um, and we're also going to talk about uh, what it was like for Eldon and his family to go through that whole process, how the church uh, helped and maybe didn't always help, and maybe most importantly, how his immediate family, his um, brother and sister and the in-laws here in, in uh, Denver, and maybe even a little bit the Mormon Stories community all kind of have, uh, have pitched in to be somewhat helpful and have been a part of, of that whole process. And we're going to end talking about how uh, grief and death and priesthood and prayer all interact when, um, when, when a family struggling with the potential loss of a loved one and what the faith and religious implications are of, uh, of losing a loved one um, when, you, when you try so hard to keep that from happening. And so at the end of the interview, um, you know, the final hour or so, we're actually going to bring on various members of Eldon's family who are all going to talk about that grieving process, 
the process of trying to pray and, and have Heather get better and having her not get better and what that was like for the family because it actually impacted the, the faith and the testimonies of, of, you know, two or three, four other families. And so we're going to have them on at the end and, uh, and then we're going to talk about where everybody is now and how they've all made it through. So it's, I, I, I tend to overuse the word epic, but for me, this is an epic story um, on Mormon stories. And uh, I'm really excited to be here. So Eldon Karchner, uh, thank you for joining us on Mormon stories. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. It's, <laughs> There's this moment of really surreal, it's almost exciting to me when you say, hello and welcome to Mormon Stories, because I've been listening since 2005, like, right, when it began. And so, oh my gosh, it's John DeLynn, like, he's <laughs> actually saying this in front of me. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Well. And it's... I'm, like, now I'm supposed to share something epic that's a lot of responsibility, but. We believe in you. To my best. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, um. Thanks for joining us, and uh, let's begin by talking about your your early years growing up in Arizona. wasn't maybe the typical Mormon experience in some ways, but in some ways it was very Mormon. And so, yeah, tell us about the Karchner home. <laughs> um, well, I think you know, I think that I would uh, almost couch it. As like a, as a real coin, there's two sides to the coin that were really happening at the same time. Because on in one storyline that is very very real, I have seven siblings, so it's very prolific Mormon family, and my dad comes from twelve, and he my mother comes from a nearby town. We're we're in a town that was settled by where the Mormon battalion had their Battle of the Bulls, so, you know, they were sent back to settle this little area, and they, there are town stories about the miracles that happened so that the area could be settled in the middle of the desert, and so it's an incredibly LDS town. There's about 2,500 people, if I have that correct still, and there's three wards, so it's very, very Mormon, and we're a very... I'd say well-known family in the area. What's the town? St. David. St. David, David, Arizona. Yeah, close to Tucson, like an hour south of Tucson. Hour south of Tucson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm the second born and the first boy in our family, and the church is kind. It's everything in the town, and it's absolutely everything in our family. Growing up, it really just it permeated i didn't i really don't think i conceived that other things existed i knew that but i don't really think that i ever truly got it we like to say i kind of grew up in the bubble of this little farm town and and but not as farmers well yeah my dad loved farming and so he wanted to own a farm so that we would have chores and he could teach us how to work but not for his career because his father had decided that all of the Karchner boys would be doctors and told them to be doctors. And so if they and he was a doctor, away, right? They went to medical school. He was a doctor. So, so his, brothers, his brothers were doctors. Yes. <laughs> there's a couple that aren't, but yeah, there's five of them that are all doctors. So he's an ER doc, drives an hour to Tucson for his shifts, but we live on the farm and had just just enough cows to milk and an orchard just big enough to have to <laughs> do it every year and water the fields and do all the irrigation and all this stuff. So we could learn how to work and have all our chores. So yeah, we that was really important to him and very and it really, I think it helped play into you know I was born in the early seventies, but really I think we were a family that kind of reflects the Mormonism of seventies eighties that. Saturday's Warrior Mormon. Yes, yes. Very Saturday's Warrior Mormon. I can sing every song for you. We're very, very... Um, Did you, know, you identify you know, with one of the characters in Saturday's Warrior? I was Jimmy. Are you were Jimmy? Jimmy? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> but you weren't, you weren't a rebel, were you? Uh, no. <laughs> Except yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about that on the other side of the coin. Well, 
Yeah. Um, but on the on the good side, I did everything I was ever supposed to do. Um, I, you know, not not the in saying so. I want that couched under the in the Mormon ideal, almost not as though I believe that this constitutes a good human being, but thinking that I was doing everything I was supposed to do um, and feeling kind of proud. You know, I was the deacon's quorum president and the teacher's quorum president and the elder's quorum president, not elder's quorum president, the um, priest. Priest, thank you. Priest quorum president and got my Eagle Scout and was in sports all year round at the high school, which, of course, it's small enough that if you go out for sports, you're in. But I'm involved in the student government. Again, small school, so popularity. Mm. But... <laughs> But and seminary president and seminary all four years and um, my our family structure was such that church was really like again it kind of ran the world so not only were we fairly churchy just in our everyday life but Sunday we were the kind of you stay in your church clothes all day on Sunday there is no TV allowed you can watch church produced movies you can watch or listen to church produced music from Desert Book. And so that because I'm such an entertainment lover, I've seen all the church movies and and I would get as many as I could. And even before VHS, I would check out the film strips from the library at church. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so these old like Lamanite go my son things that Cypher in the Snow, oh, the yes. Lingo, um, I, the Mailbox, for everything. <laughs> I watched them all over and over and over because I like to watch entertainment and Love, love, love the music. The I mean, people abhor LDS pop music, and I love it. <laughs> Still do. You didn't use past tense. I know. I know. So like Stephen Capri, yes, Kenneth Cole, Michael Webb, everything from I mean, Janice Capri, all the EFY stuff. Love it, love it. In high school, we discovered EFY. It was just starting up. And so we went for several years in a row, and oh, that was heaven on earth. I loved it. I got really into <clears throat> writing in my journal, and I really needed to read the Book of Mormon and finish it before high school's over, and was really, really planning for a mission because that's what I needed to do. And But I was it's not just what I needed to do. I was a believer. I was an absolute, complete believer. It was It was really my whole life. Everything was based on it what I was supposed to do for a career, what I should do about my family. Well, everything about the future was based in what the church said or what answers to prayers I could get. I was really, really into studying the spirit and understanding what the spirit felt like so that I could have revelations and know what to do with my life because that seems like a really important thing to have to have constant revelation. That's what happens in the scripture, so... I loved studying the Holy Ghost, but also I love feeling it and this sense of peace and love and goodness and happiness and joy and listening out the fruits of the spirit that, I mean, I just, I craved them. And so I sought it out all the time through music, through the movies, through reading my scriptures, through going to seminary, through, and you know, it just permeated our entire life. And after high school, I went off to a little junior college that was predominantly Mormon in Thatcher, Arizona, which is has lots and lots of Mormons where President Kimball grew up. And at Eastern Arizona College, this um, there was a huge institute that I was really involved with there and a great music program at the school that was run by an LDS gentleman. And so that was quite spiritually based. I mean, it couldn't be Mormon, but it was very spiritual. And I loved it. And then I prepped for my mission and went on my mission to Montana which was a little random. I hadn't heard of anybody going to Montana. But in the end, I loved it. I was so excited to be a missionary. Um, when I went on my mission, that was hard. Just just because I was homesick a lot. Did you ever serve in Bozeman? Yeah. I, oh, Bozeman's awesome. I love Bozeman. Um, and by the time I got to Bozeman, I actually loved my mission. So You didn't love it at first? I was so homesick um, for uh, being at this junior college with friends and <clears throat> fun and wonderfulness. And when I got on a mission, it was really hard for me because 
missionaries are 19, which is the euphemistic way of saying they're dirty and dumb and (laughs) they don't, they sleep in and don't obey the rules. And I was kind, I like in retrospect, I kind of think I was a jerk as a missionary, almost out of desperation because I so wanted to feel spirit and feel good and not be homesick. And the answer to that clearly was that you have to work. If you don't feel good on your mission, you're not working hard enough. So I wanted to be up earlier than necessarily and go to bed one minute before 1030 and follow everything. I mean, like I read the missionary guide and listened to the missionary guide tapes and anybody that from that ever had those knows that that's ridiculous. Like they're so crazy, but that's what we're supposed to do. So I did everything. So any missionaries, any companions that I had that weren't willing to just do it, do it, do it. I was just so mad at them because they were in my way and in, they were in my righteous way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I couldn't feel super good if they weren't just doing what they were supposed to do with me. So in that way, a mission was hard, but what wasn't hard was teaching people because I love teaching people. I love testifying about the gospel. I love studying my scriptures. I love all of those moments about being a missionary. And it was about halfway through my mission that I met a sister missionary who was just incredible. And we became really good friends. Um, and one day, somehow this conversation came up where she was like, oh, yeah, I love this. And I was... I literally was like, wait, you like doing this? Like, you like being Mm -hmm. on a mission? She was like, yeah, I love it. And that was really foreign to me. I thought it was this thing that I got joy out of because I was doing what I was supposed to do. And, And I decided really to change my experience around and think, I think I'm going to love this. I'm, I'm going to love this. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to like it. We're going to have a good time. Sister Power can do it. I can do it. And I did. So the second half of my mission, I was really like, I love this. I do. I love it. <laughs> there were plenty of times that I probably didn't. And I was just pulling out, you know, the, the old Joseph Smith principle, testify, and then you'll believe it. So I would tell people, I love being on a mission all the time. But I really did get there. By the time I left, I was sad to go. I loved that. Mm. And what was your testimony based on? Was it some some Grove-like experience where you Mm. read that Book of Mormon and and accepted Moroni's challenge and said that prayer and got the witness? Had you ever even tried to get a, a concrete witness? Did you even care? Or did you just sort of assume that you had a witness from the start? Really yeah, I I don't think that I even knew there were people who didn't pray but went and find out it was true but just went to church their whole life. <laughs> I didn't know that existed. Of course I prayed about it a whole lot when I was a teenager. Hello, I went to EFY. This is I know what you're supposed to do. I prayed about Joseph Smith. I prayed about the Book of Mormon. I can remember kneeling by my bread, my bed, and getting this real like kind of voice in my head because sometimes my answers would be voice in my head that you already know it's true and I went yes yes I do yeah I do that was so peaceful for me and I was so happy I knew the book of Mormon was true which meant that Joseph Smith was a prophet but I prayed about him separately anyway just to be sure and of (laughs) course he was Um, that was all as a teenager but I was really into reaffirming like praying about it again Not from a, I don't know, but from a, you know, Heavenly Father, make my testimony stronger. Mm. I, I believed in this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I had spiritual experience after spiritual experience over and over about the truthfulness. Wow. Yeah. I, I really, I I was a very like spiritual experience based person. Right. That sounds, uh, that sounds like a firm foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Now, conceptually, I can remember thinking, you have to be strong or you can fall. I mean, not that I didn't have to be strong, but just that you, 
there's that would never happen. Never happen. But you do have to be strong. You have to really pray and read every day to stay strong or something strange could happen. And that being strange thing is Satan who can really right. come after you because he was after me all the time. Right. I'm sure. Of it. So you talk about um, your upbringing be kind of, being kind of two sides of a coin. You've talked about the, the dreamy Mormon good side. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we jump to the, the darker side of the coin? <laughs> um, well, I think just the end of the, I, I came home, I went to three semesters at the University of Arizona, um, which was a great place. I was, again, very focused, kind of my whole base of existence there was the institute and the institute building and the people in the institute because it's all church. It's all about my whole life was focused inside of church. And I met nice people in my classes who would be like, come do stuff with us. And I'm like, mm. no. I have Mormon friends. <laughs> I'm not snotty, just my interest was all church-based. That's where I wanted to be. It's where I was comfortable. Um, then after three semesters at the U of A, I transferred as a junior to BYU, where my whole, and I'd been studying how to be a seminary teacher, like the, doing all the classes on getting into seminary teaching. CES. Yes. Yes. Um, and I actually got hired to do it full time once I, like my junior year at U of A, to do it full time in Arizona the year after I graduated. So in one year, but that's when I decided to transfer to BYU because I had a revelation. That's what I'm supposed to do. And so I called that off and went to BYU where I was really excited to get involved with teaching at the MTC and with going to be with the Young Ambassadors because I really love, love, loved doing performance. I had been in dance classes, you know, growing up. And so BYU was kind of this really fun mecca to go do stuff. And I loved BYU. There is no question I will say it till the day I die. I love BYU. You can do any class you want there almost. Like anything you want to do, they, they have a class for it is what I felt like. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And you know, it took a year of work and a lot of preparation to get finally accepted and get my audition into the Young Ambassadors and get in it. But that was that was the top of the mountain for me I think, to be part of that because I didn't plan to do performance for my life, for my career. So it really was this is my shebang. This is what I get to do, and I loved it. I, and BYU, it's spiritual, it's wonderful. And I heard a lot of complaints from people, and I actually thought quite often, maybe people really need to transfer here. You need an experience somewhere else in the world, and then you transfer to BYU, and it won't feel so crazy mm -hmm. to you, which is really funny to me because as I reflect, I was not in the world. I spent every day in the Institute, walked to class, and came back. <laughs> but In Arizona, in Arizona. In Arizona. Yeah. But it was good. So right. loved it, loved it. And Young Ambassadors travel the world, right? Yes. I went to South Africa my first year and um, Thailand my second. It, how else would I do that? <laughs> it was amazing. And do you, do you travel all over the U.S. performing? In different we, did, we did a tour to, up to Oregon and we did a tour over to California at the beginning of the second semesters of each year, but... And then you perform for the royalty in Utah, you know, general authority. Right, and, yes, when they have little things. And the royalty in Like Zimbabwe, for general authorities and stuff? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think if we actually had any of those during my years. And I'm not recalling specifically, but, you know, you're at the homecoming performance, you do this. It really, it's the elite performing group of the music dance theater program. At least it was when I was there. It's, it's so awesome. I really felt like, how did I get in this? I mean, I was surrounded by performers who are now on Broadway because they're so, so good. That Really? Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just, it was so incredible. Mm. So, so awesome. Okay. So, um, Loved it. <laughs> Other side of the coin. <laughs> yeah, so so parallel to this is a, a not necessarily so happy existence for Eldon. Right, because while all of that is absolutely true, at the same time, um, I, I was 
I'm gay. And as a young man, I knew it, I knew it conceptually very early on. And even in the small farm town back in the eighties, I knew the word gay because it was a horrific word. <laughs> and I think that I was gentle enough as a personality and I went to dance class that there was just enough stereotypical about me in a farm town that even though I was milking cows and playing football, I got teased growing up through elementary school. By the time I got to high school, I think that the teasing was pretty much over because we were all the same kids as we were in kindergarten pretty much. And so I think like that ship had sailed in terms of teasing people about it. Right. But so I knew what being gay was and I knew that I was very sexually attracted to men, but I, I just was in so much denial about this is not true. It's not me. It just, it won't be, it'll go away someday. But I did have a sense. I, I would secretly study it on the side. And I did have a sense that it re I was required to be a lot more righteous than maybe even other people because, so, uh, because and, there's something wrong with me. And what age did you first kind of identify as same-sex attraction? Any idea? Any remember? Yeah, it, it was early. Like I, I knew, i say by about eight or nine. Eight or nine? Yeah. I That's really, early. I knew. Wow. But, you know, to be honest, that's also in reflection. I think if you met eight or nine-year-old me, I wouldn't be able to give you those words. Right. But in reflection, I, I have memories of things that I thought mm -hmm. at the time. And can go, yeah, I, if you can say, I knew, I knew, as much as a child can know. Um and I knew that that was bad, and I knew that it was something wrong with me. And that combined with this, I was so into the church. The message that I picked up from the church was really about, I mean, I think it was based in works. Grace is all good. That's super nice. But you have, it's only after all that you can do. And, you know, my experience was that especially... 70s, 80s Mormonism was really a focus on after all you can do. I think it still is now, but, um, and I owned that way early on. I need to be good. It's all about what I need to do because I have to get that. Um, and which equals that I'm not good enough already, period. I am not good enough. And so I would say that's the theme of what I picked up way, way, way too early and way too strongly. I, I knew I wasn't good enough. Even though you were super high achieving. Yeah. No, that, that, that was to like kind of be good enough, to barely be there. Um, to And so I just think that I sought out the spirit all the time and wanted to feel it all the time because it was like a really – temporary buzz. I could feel that God loved me, but then it very quickly settled back into, but I have to do something better. He loves me, but that's because he knows what I can be that I'm not. Right. And so, and I really need my spiritual fix again in order to keep me going because by the time I'm getting 12, 13, I was already starting to be really depressed. I think that had a lot to do with being gay, even though I didn't put that together at the time. I was just an emotional and a sensitive human being. And also, the fair truth is, my parents are, well, all human beings are emotional. They are not emotionally expressive about harsh things. They're happy to say I love you. They're happy to smile. And they're happy to focus on that, which I think is also extremely influenced by Mormonism because I come from pioneer stock everywhere. I just think it's like over this cumulative experience of Mormon thought that really came into what was in my home, which for us was happy, good, sad, bad. And I was becoming really depressed because I wasn't good enough and having a hard time with me. And the more depressed I was, 
the angrier my parents got about it. My dad just is a person who doesn't say much at all, at all. So I really just didn't get much from him. But my mom is very expressive about what she thinks and what she feels that's good. And my depression from, again, it's hard to talk about somebody else. Like I don't want to own what her experience. I can only say how I saw it. She was just angry at me all the time. All the time. Because your, your I was mom sad. was angry. Oh, yeah. She was furious. For being sad. Yeah. Yeah. And so I became known in the family as the black sheep. I was Jimmy. I was the problem child. But not for sexual promiscuity, not for substance <laughs> abuse. I never once drank. I never tried drugs. I never snuck out. I never had a sexual problem. I never... So it was just for being depressed. Yeah. Because the family needed to... Uh... We needed to be happy and we needed to show happy. And I knew how to show happy. And that You're a performer. The, yeah. And the more that I did that, the, more, the better I got at it. And the more it kind of sort of split me where I'm... And that left me more depressed internally. So that I'm going to school and making good grades, smiling for people because I need to smile for them. Although I was, as a teenager, I was desperately trying to tell people I'm not well in subtler ways, but I was really, yeah, I was not well, so depressed and in so much trouble for being depressed. And the fact that I was the problem for my parents because they didn't know how to handle me. And granted this also, I wanted to go see my friends and not, I didn't want to be with my family all the time. I wanted to see my friends and... I would argue because I like to listen to music all the time and I didn't always listen to church music. Sometimes I listen to pop music, really only top 40, but this was filled with sin and was going to make me run out and have sex and do drugs. And so I got in a lot of trouble off her because I, I liked terrible music and mm. I truly like Madonna, it. right? Yes. Yes. All this eighties state music wonder <laughs> as the school DJ for all the music. I have all these little 45s, but I I just was a problem for them because I just wasn't toe the line and sometimes I didn't agree with what they wanted or I didn't want to milk the cows. I just wanted to do something else and disagreement was bad and not obedient and all of this internalized as, see, I am bad. There's something wrong with me. I'm the black sheep. I'm the problem, which in retrospect is literally capital C crazy. You couldn't get a more perfect performing child than I was. So was your depression manifested through sleeping too much? Was it manifested through, I mean, if I, as I think of the typical signs of depression, it's like sleeping too much or too little, eating right. too much or too little, uh, losing interest in, in things. But it sounds like you were highly functional, highly mm -hmm. active, uh, highly achieving. So how did the depression come out? Well, in part, in part, I love what you're saying because I think this develops a lot for gay people who are incredibly repressed that they develop the ability to be extremely functional in their misery and that it's a lot more dangerous to develop this ability to say, Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. And go home and want to die. But, it, but, but but it's unless it's affecting your life, it's not really a mental illness. Unless it's manifesting. Well, on, on one hand, for teenagers, it can be a lot different that you end up agitated as a teenager. Oh, irritable, so, irritable. Yeah, okay. That it, you're really irritable. But also, I, I, it wasn't that I was sleeping more. I would have on and off eating problems, but it showed a whole lot more. I became a cutter okay. all through high school. Um, that sometimes was I couched. We didn't have that word then. I don't, I don't know if really anybody did, but... So show the show where you cut. I just, I, you don't have to just show Yeah, I, I was a cutter here on my wrist, and then I would, strangely in Arizona, I would just wear long sleeves all the time. In the summer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to cover it up. Um, so you would take out a razor blade and just cut mm -hmm. gashes in your arms. And this would have been back in the... This was the late 80s. Late 80s. When I was in high school, yeah. So cutting wasn't maybe as well known as it is now. No, no. And you I didn't get the idea 
No, from anybody talking about cunning. In retrospect, that's the word that I put on it because at the time I would think I'm slitting my wrist. I'm trying to kill myself, even though I knew that I wasn't. There were a couple times that I was really serious about it and a few times that I got truly suicidal. But when I did get fully, truly suicidal, I went to the medicine cabinet and had some really close calls, which... So did your parents know you were cutting? Um, at one point, I got caught. Only only one time did they actually catch. And I mean, they were, they were so... Again, this is from my 14-year-old perspective, what I was seeing. They were so, so mad at me about this. So mad. My mom's... This isn't nice, but it's just what happened. My mom's response when she found me doing this was, what is you, what is your grandmother going to think? And, you know, because she was, I, she really kind of, I think, struggles with what her mom thought of her. But, you know, it wasn't, are you okay? Or what's going on for you? Or it was really focused on, oh my gosh, nobody can know about this. Which is what cared. They did call my uncle, who was the bishop. So, there, I mean, it was kind of a trap in at the time. My uncle was the bishop. My stake president was a different uncle. So, right. um, he came over and sat down and tried to talk with me. And I was like, I don't know, I have anything to say to you. I just, I, I didn't want to talk to any of them. And so they put me in counseling for a little while where they drove me up to Tucson to LDS Social Services once a month. Whereas a teenager, I can actually remember just lying to the guy. <laughs> the whole thing. Do you do this? Do you do that? Do you, are you having this problem? Do you think about this? And I'm like, nah, I'm fine. So in your in your 14-year-old mind, are you thinking, I'm gay and I'm Mormon, and so I need to kill myself? No. Or, not at all? No. I didn't put that together. All I knew is that I was worthless. That's the biggest peace for me. I just felt worthless. And so I wanted to not exist. And I think Mormonism was an interesting trap, like pushing me and stopping me because I thought so many times, I can't even kill myself because I know I'll keep existing. It won't work. Because I was so sure of the church's truthfulness. Right. But I was so worthless that I really didn't deserve any of the blessings. So I just, um, yeah, I think that, like, even when it was clear that I was making big suicide attempts, the point of the experience was to keep it hidden. You know, just when I was found completely blacked out, having an overdose, the, like, the next several days response, the only response I got was, you know, if this keeps happening, we will take you to the hospital and people will find out. That's what I was told. That was the threat. Right. That people, people find will it. find out. Which was apparently the worst thing that could possibly happen. And, you know, bless my parents' souls. I just don't think they had any idea what to do. So was do you think the family ethic was we want to deceive everyone else? Or was it just... The gospel is true and we want to let the light so shine. I mean, what, you know, someone who wouldn't know your parents as people, I'm sure there's lots of people who know your parents as beautiful, warm, oh, they're, loving, they're generous, amazing. and that's how people know them. People, yeah. yet at the same time, the way you're describing them, it's like they don't even really care about you. Right. They're worried about what everybody thinks, which probably wouldn't right. be a fair way to judge them, right? No, but that was my experience with them, and, and that's what it continued to isolate me. Because I knew that this is my experience and that I am not important to them. What matters to them is what everybody else sees. But that's not the way that they are thinking in their own head about themselves. Yeah, they're probably thinking, oh, it's one of the most important people in my life. Yeah, and the way to save him is to point out that we need to stop doing this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And... So I, I'm feeling like I'm not even important enough to them that they even want me around and they're proving it and they're trying to do what matters to them from a church perspective. You got to look good. You got to act 
well thy part. You gotta, and if we could just stuff this under and shut it up for long enough, then you'll be fine and surely things will come around. And so could we just stop having this problem? <laughs> right. And did homosexuality ever come up in the high school years? No. Between you and your parents? Never. Never. What about through you and the therapist that you talked to? Never. The bishop? Or? The therapist never even asked, never even insinuated, never with the bishop. Um, the, the first time that it came up between me and my parents, I was 27. 27? Yeah. So during the high school years, did you ever begin to internally self-identify as gay? No. Didn't identify it as gay? I, I knew inside my own head and heart what I was attracted to. I mean, I, I sort of dated, but not because not until 16 and not unless you're in a group, um, sort of right. went out with this girl through, all through high school, but I never even kissed her until after our senior prom, which was one kiss and it was a surprise to her and that, but it was so easy to couch in, but I'm just being righteous. Right. Yeah. I'm just being yeah. a good yeah. Mormon boy. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And isn't that so good of me? Right. I can feel better about myself because I'm doing Righteousness. Thanks. You're you're somehow able to be a lot more moral than all your male counterparts. Exactly. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, you know, it's a way to almost feel better than other people, which sort of equals out the fact that I also feel worthless. I mean, again, these things are happening together in the same person. This, which I think is true of all human beings, but this dualism and this need to hide this and must be this. Developing the ability to do that, I think, was so, so encouraged by Mormonism. And, right. and it, you know, tried to destroy me. It was literally trying to destroy me all through my teenage years that I'm trying to die. What about temptation to want to experiment with men and boys? Was that ever prominent in well, those years? I, That was in my mind. I mean, I was still a teenager with lots and lots and lots of hormones, but so I would imagine that. However, no real temptation. I'm in a Mormon farm town. There was nothing there. Right. Nothing. Nor was I going to do anything. Right. At all. I was not. I. It just It couldn't have happened. I was too do what is right, and, like, if I did something wrong, my guilt was right. unbearable. Any other high school reflections or stories before we talk quickly about BYU? No, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I'd say that this all went through. I, I, I started to feel better about myself when I was really connecting, especially, like, we start going to EFY and uh, meeting other people that are spiritual and... This is when I start to read the Book of Mormon. And I think in part, I was growing up. You develop, like, you develop as you grow through the teen years so quickly. And as I was growing up, there was a little bit balancing out in me, I think. And I was maturing just enough to say, it's, you know, maybe it's possible that when I feel the spirit, it actually means that I'm not totally worthless. And things started to balance out for me, but this was also very correlated with me deciding to keep a journal and write down all the revelations that I could possibly get that the Lord was giving me and read the Book of Mormon. So I really started to associate, I'm reading the Book of Mormon and I think I'm feeling better and I go to EFY, which helps me feel better, and I listen to my music, which helps me feel better. Clearly the church is the answer. Right. It is like, I just have to be... It's like a treadmill. Churchy... 24 7. Right. Really, really, really churchy. It's like a religio spiritual treadmill. Totally. That you couldn't get off. Totally. Which, you know, like I'm saying on my mission, which I love, but any time I didn't feel good, we got to get more spiritual. We got to get, you know, some Holy Ghost up in here. It's kind of <laughs> it's kind of medicating anxiety through righteousness. It's exactly what it was. Is that right? Yeah. Some people eat, some people uh -huh. drink. Which, you know, contributes to my going, see, it's true. So it reinforces. It reinforces. Yeah. Have the mission. It's all good. Now, there was, I mean, the mission was hard for the times that it was hard, but I would focus on the spirit. Um, after the mission, there was darkness because, again, I would kind of slip into depression. Because after the mission, now 
what the crap am I going to do? I have now fulfilled the point of my whole life, except for getting married. And that's when I really started to address right after my mission. Well, I'd say about a year after my mission, I really started to address. I don't know how to make this work. Because I'm hanging out in the Institute all the time. So it is very clear that these girls that are surrounded, surrounding me are all kinds of, you're a return missionary, let's do this. <laughs> they were wanting you. Oh, yeah. I mean, they want to get on with their spiritual progression and purpose of life as well. Right. And I couldn't do it because I knew. I, I dated a few girls, but I knew that I could not love them entirely. And I wasn't willing to do it to them, I, to do that to them. To, so this is before BYU. Yeah, this is even at, yeah. at University of Arizona. Yeah, this is really where I'm starting to get You're dating right. these institute girls. Uh, yeah. And you're going out on dates. Yeah. And what happens? You just. It's not happening. I'm not interested in them at all. I have no interest in going on another date with them whatsoever. And they do. And I, so know they're, they're they're attracted to you. and I know that I'm in this kind of small microcosm where they're talking to their other people and they're saying, I went on a date and I, and we want, I want to do this some more and I'm really interested in Eldon and that if I don't start reciprocating this with somebody on a little more consistent basis, then the what's going on is going to start to fly. Right. So I'm trying to date people like just enough to say well see but then i could just didn't work give it a fair effort it's so much work it's so much work and energy to make this do, do you have enough information to know whether they were physically attracted to you these girls yeah they were they were yeah because why i don't know why are you physically attracted to them so they would... yeah they were interested okay but it, did you ever try and kiss or try and you know, make out or hold hands or no. a lot. No, like I think I was still trying to ride the wave of like righteousness. Righteousness of well, well, you know, it's I'm trying to be a really good priesthood holder and not taint anything about our potential beautiful relationship, and so we're not going to get inappropriate. Okay, and so I was that, really just trying to be asexual. I was really trying to just right, right. turn everything off. Okay. And so you you say it was exhausting to just perpetually be mm -hmm. uh, prematurely terminating these relationships. Not prematurely right. for you. But and again, before BYU, this was only a period of 18 months, um, even though development in the young years seems like a lot bigger and, and faster. But there, there was a point at the U of A where I started to become really depressed again because I don't know how to make this work and it's not working. And at one point, I didn't feel the spirit for like a month. And I panicked, went to my bishop and everything. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I was teaching seminary. I'm like, what's wrong? What's happening to me? And I feel like so just panicked because I you, were, was you were like a spiritual spirit. addict. Completely. And you were. Yes. It's your, my your only source been, of good. Your drug had been taken away. You yes. were going through kind of yes. withdrawal. I, I, and I, was, I don't. Of course, I couched it in with. This was to strengthen me, and the Lord gave me it as a trial that I didn't feel the Spirit for a while. But I eventually, um, in the third semester, I, I made friends with somebody who I became attracted enough to this person, this boy, that I went, okay, this is real, and this is a problem. And there was no, nothing back. In fact, the fact that we were really good friends, I started to sense that this person really was like, I don't want to hang out anymore. And I wasn't doing anything crazy, but I think that there were some, I wasn't dating enough girls and I was hanging out with him all the time. He wasn't gay. He, not at all. And I was, you know, also a singer and dancer in the Institute Chorale that like put all this together and people are like, Mm. And the hmm made him go, um, he pulled away and was like, didn't really want to be friends anymore, which made me super depressed. Was this the impetus to you losing the spirit? No. Well, I wondered. I, yes, I absolutely was like, um, maybe, maybe this is why I don't feel the spirit. I'm, that's, that's it, okay. And 
Maybe I'll feel very more because uh, because I have like moved from complete denial into a place of even sort of accepting it and actually being attracted to someone else, even though I really didn't want to be. But because that was happening in my body, this attraction clearly I'm being taught my lesson about that. So I went to BYU not only because it was this good idea and there's many opportunities, but also in great, great part to flee to get away this from this boy me. specifically, or just, just the whole situation of like, start over. I need to start over. I am depressed because I have realized that I actually am really attracted to boys, and <laughs> that's not okay. And sometimes I don't feel the spirit and. People wonder about me here, and I mean, I'm so focused on what people think about me. They're probably not thinking about me at all, but I'm so focused on it. And how could I not be? That was my whole upbringing. We have to appear well. Um, that I, ugh, I just I ran. I ran to BYU, and all of its wonderful opportunities. And you got in the Young Ambassadors, and we're having a good time with all those. Very heterosexual other males <laughs> in Young and Best. I, again, loved, loved, loved it. Um, I, it took me a year at BYU to, I made some really good friends. Um, I prepared for my audition. I really worked hard. I had intended to teach at the MTC, but didn't, the first time I, I um, went in, I didn't get hired and, so I went there and things didn't work out immediately and I was kind of like, oh, you know, this crushed. So I taught, um, taught seminary for a little while in Orem, uh, their special education seminary for this whole first year. But this was all prepped to get in Young Ambassadors and get teaching at the MTC so my whole dream could come true and I would be back on Righteous Top. So On what? Um, on the Righteous Top of the Mountain. The, the Righteous, righteous Top. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I did. Eventually I did. I got hired and I loved it. Oh, I love teaching at the MTC. It was heaven. I loved it. English speaking machines. Yes. Okay. Yes. So all I was doing was teaching them how to teach discussions and how to share spiritual experiences and how to identify the spirit with other people. Heaven for me. It, I mean, this is a place where you get to go and snort your crack. <laughs> Every spiritual day. yeah spiritual crack. obviously that's yeah. that's what i'm referring to like you yeah. you don't even have to do it on your own you get, like this is what you're supposed to do and um getting in the young ambassadors which is amazing and so fun and i just i wanted to play and i was having so much fun with this whole experience and the whole first year was really 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 amazing and i loved it i just everything loved everything and i was so busy and running and doing all the stuff that i loved and the campus was big enough, because I'm not hanging out in this tiny little institute, that the fact that I wasn't dating anybody, I don't think that was registering for anybody around me. Right. Because we're busy and we're running and we're having so much fun. And I and I had some friends that I was, in my own personal life, I was, you know, like, sort of dating and then, okay, I, this just isn't going to work. I'm just not in love with you. I'm really sorry, but, you know, you're a swell girl. And I'm trying really, really hard not to do that to girls, because it's hurtful. But for the most part, I felt like all eyes are not on me anymore about why aren't you dating and that felt good. So I'm trying, this is just a random question, but I'm trying to figure out how uh, a straight woman becomes attracted to a gay man and specifically what keeps them from just having this gaydar sense of this guy's gay. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to want to be attracted to him or like him because he, you know, it may be that you were artistic and and they kind of observed you and yeah. maybe their gator went off and and yet there's these women who are still attracted to you. Do you have a sense for how that works? Well, this is the mid-90s, so I don't think that many Mormon... I, I imagine it's different now. But I don't think that many, especially LDS girls at all, had any gator. I mean, they just... There wasn't a sense that that was real or really out there. Um, and again, this is that all still wasn't really part, penetrating the consciousness of Mormonism. No, no, not at all. And the um, the idea that if someone was incredibly effeminate with whether they were gay or not, I don't. I think that that was not necessarily attractive to a girl. But for someone trying very purposefully 
not to be gay, and yet for all this stuff to come out that is still natural there anyway, hey, I can notice that you're beautiful, and you look really good, and your colors go together, and let's talk about our feelings, and let's, <laughs> you know, let's watch Anna Green Gables together. I, all the stuff that, but I'm, but I'm totally straight, I'm putting that on, how is that not attractive <laughs> to especially a very sweet LDS girl who's like, hey, I, we got to be eternally together and raise children together. And you look like you'll be a super sensitive, really good dad who cares about my feelings and actually remembers what I said when I said something. <laughs> How are you not attracted? Right. Obviously, I'm not a girl. I can't speak to it from that angle. But that's just that's my speculation. And did you ever play with the way you spoke or acted to try and, you know, make it more masculine? Is that something? I think a little bit. But what we're hearing and seeing now is comparable yeah. to how you would have acted. Yeah. Now. Okay. So it wasn't like you. No, I don't try to get too broad. Even though when I, <laughs> all, I think all through my life when I look back or I would listen to myself or see myself on tape and I'd be like, way too gay. You know, because that's bad. When you would see yourself yeah. on tape. Okay. But and by girls, gay, I'm not, really I'm talking about way too effeminate, which are not the same thing. But we've so associated them in our culture that are they at least somewhat associated? Well, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think like at the least stereotype. A .5 correlation? Yeah, the stereotype doesn't exist for nothing. Right. But I, you know, I I would not want to sound gay at all or look gay. So I was trying not to be, even though. So the second year at BYU, I, I was you know coming along doing well, which is my last. Well, my second year in Young Ambassadors was my last year at BYU. Um, I met a wonderful friend who is still a really good friend who, um, in the really, really crude term, I don't have a better term for it, so I'm sorry that it's kind of crude, but women who are gay men's friend are called their hag. And, it, like, if people don't know that term, there's got to be... I've heard beard. That, but yeah. Is beard different than hag? Well... A, a, I think a little bit. Beard is a front, someone who looks like a girlfriend. Uh-huh, but isn't. Okay. And you're, usually if you refer to a hag, it's somebody who totally knows. She's just like your best girlfriend, and she likes being with the guys. Got it. So, um, and again, that's a yucky word, so we won't use it anymore. But, um, Never heard it before. <laughs> there you it's go. It's good to know. Um, she was a really good friend of mine. But she knew all the gay boys at BYU. And all the gay boys at Rick's, it was Rick's at the time, not BYU, I, who had come to BYU. Um, a great deal of them, because again, there's something about this stereotype. I think Carolyn Pearson t speaks about it beautifully, but there's, art there's artistic something about being same-sex attracted. So the music dance theater department is filled, filled with homosexual men or men who are maybe not all the way homosexual or but even just slightly or it's just filled. Same, she, with, the Mormon, same with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Right, right. right. All artistic stuff, you're going to have a greater preponderance of I said that word right. Um, but she knew them all. All of them. And so I, so I think she kind of delighted in outing them to me because she knew the moment she met me. I mean, her gaydar was sharp. And so she knew right away and she like called me out on it. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, maybe it's all right that she thinks that. But I was really like, no, no, it's not true. Not me. Everybody else you know, but not me. And she was like, okay. All right. I mean, <laughs> she didn't believe it for a second, but she started... I think it was sort of her way of trying to move me along my process is that she started outing everybody else, not in front of them, but do you know that this person's gay and this person's gay and this person's gay and this person's gay. And she's naming off to me all of these people that I know in the music dance theater department and all of these guys that are with me in the young ambassadors. And it wasn't all of them. It's not 100%, but she's naming off a large, large amount of them. And I'm freaking out. I really kind of dealt like dove a little into being depressed at the time because as dumb as it sounds in retrospect, I 
kind of just really thought it was me. I, I did. You were the only gay guy. Conceptually, of course, there's other ones, but really it's, yeah, it really is only me. And not just that they are, not just all these other guys that are gay, who is so many of them around me, but also here is the great portion of them who are gay, who are getting together and sleeping together. And What? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm sorry. This is BYU. I know. What? See, it was blowing my mind. It was really Is like, it? this cannot be the case. It is one thing for you to tell me that there are more out there, but now you are telling me they are breaking the honor code, and that is not okay. We have rules here. They are rules from God, and I just couldn't even... I didn't know what to do with myself. Even young ambassadors, maybe? Um, a couple. Yeah, some of them. Yes. Mm. And maybe more than I knew. But um, it just... I couldn't. I didn't know what to do with it for a long time, and but I think it was all a big part of pushing me to be out with myself. So then my work really became personally. How am I? What am I going to do about it now that it exists all out there and all these people are doing these terrible, horrible, awful things that you're not supposed to do by hooking up with each other, which I am never going to do. And so clearly, in order to stay righteous, I need to get further from it. So then I had a real difficult time finishing up BYU because it occurred to me that everything stereotypically gay in our culture um, that I needed to not be and I needed to have nothing to do with is all that I have to offer the world. Oh, so if you wanted to be not gay, you would have to give up singing and dancing and art, and, artistic stuff. And being stuff. kind and being artistic and being like, yes, you can be, you know, learn how to be kind and elder scorn kind of nice. But I was gentle and I was emotional and I was artistic and like, all this stuff Touchy -feely. has to go. And if it doesn't go at a minimum, it's what's wrong with me. All the stuff that's best about me is what's wrong with me. And so I kind of, I started falling hard into, oh, maybe I, maybe I thought I wasn't worthless, but I probably am. There's just something internally flawed about me. And in between, I was still doing, you know, all the stuff that I love and smiling about it. And this is all really good. And, Still trying a few times to date some girls, and it's not working out. But really, I'm just so busy that I can't. And so then I graduated to BYU. Wait. <laughs> okay. But you went, but you did some reparative therapy while you were at BYU. After. Okay. Okay. Just keep going. So I graduated from BYU not really having a clue what I was going to do. Because... And never having had a real serious girlfriend. <sighs> no. I mean, I, I dated some girls for several months. Or I'd had really best friends where we talked about, you know, gosh, I just don't know why it's not happening with you, but it really should. But we're so close. I wish we were, well, <laughs> you know, and right. girls being emotional sometimes just eat that up. I don't right. want to disparage that about women. But um, I, I had tried dating, but hadn't just it really. I want to say that truthfully, I, I had given it a fair chance because for several months at a time, I had dated several girls and really tried. Right. I had. When I graduated BYU, I graduated in psychology with the intent that I was going to move on and be a counselor, but I kind of had a little life crisis almost every year of college towards the spring semester about what am I going to do because I don't like this. I don't. Psychology is what I was meant to go into because I'm touchy-feely and can listen to people and it's the only thing I could come up with, but I was never going to go into performing. Ever. I was told very early, we'll take you to dance class, but you will not do this for a profession. You cannot support a family with it, and you will have a family. Like this was all be a doctor. out loud talk. <laughs> yeah. And I don't and it wasn't uh, my dad was like, my dad made me be a doctor. I'm not gonna make you anything. I have to do that. But but my it was my mom's clear idea that I was gonna be a counselor, and that kind of fit for me, so I was going to do that, but when I graduated with a bachelor's, you, you know what you can do with a bachelor's in psychology? 
Nothing. 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 <laughs> you can go work you at can a go to treatment graduate center. school. You can go to graduate school. <laughs> um, you can make ten dollars an hour at a treatment center. So right. when I graduated, I really didn't know what I was going to do. In retrospect, I would like I would have loved to have studied interior design. I would have loved it. I would have thrived with that. But that was never possible. That was way too gay. So I just, right. it, there was no way. Um, I could have done performing and got really serious about it, but I never really did get serious about it because there was no way. It wasn't going to happen. Um, graduated, stayed in Provo for a year, which was harsh. Because um, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. So I'm like, well, I'm here. And my friends are all here. But my friends were all still in classes, and they were still in the Young Ambassadors, and they were still doing what they were doing. And I was a server at Los Hermanos. <laughs> Los Hermanos! <laughs> yes. Where I learned that Unfortunately, people in Provo are the worst tubers in the world. But <laughs> I I was doing that, and I got a part-time job at Wasatch Treatment Center. But between all the stuff that I was doing, I was just miserable. I moved out of my BYU apartment because I thought, well, I've got to do something new. But then I couldn't – I didn't find another apartment. I ended up for several months in a um, camper trailer in my aunt's front yard. I mean – it's just like it was kind of going downhill for what am I doing with my life? Yeah. <laughs> and I got so, so, oh, so depressed. Just darkness. And finally walked out onto the porch of my aunt's house with the phone and called up Elias Social Services. Um, it was several months after my graduation. And it said, I need to come in for counseling. And I don't know why, but the woman on the phone said, are you homosexual? <laughs> and that was really my first time out loud saying, yeah, I am. That's why I'm coming. So then I started my reparative therapy for the rest, for not quite a year, like 10 months. And what was that like? Well, what was the theory? This, so this was, this was in 1999 into 2000. So it was not, there was no, shocking of the genitals or like some of the truly crazy stuff that happened before that that was over but well i don't know if it was over it never happened to me right um mine was a mine was talk therapy based on you learned how to be gay and that is why you think you're gay because you learned it and so we're going to unlearn what's the yeah you must unlearn what you had to learn <laughs> um i I did not like the therapist at all, but I thought I was, he was an authority figure and he was a church based authority figure. So I obeyed whatever he told me I did. Um, and in fact, like one time I was talking about, I'm so depressed. And he was like, we're really not going to talk about that. But if you continue telling me you're depressed, I will put you on medication. So I think you need to either start running about 45 minutes a day to get rid of this in your body, or we will put you on medication. And it was literally like that. It was this threat. And I thought, oh, okay. So I started running <laughs> because that's what I was supposed to do. Right. I mean, yay for being in shape, but it it's just weird. And he constantly was telling me about the things that I needed to, I needed to, you know, stop talking to my mother because she was overbearing and that was part of why I was gay. And I needed to start talking to my father because I had to have a more father-son relationship and he would talk about how your dad's going to fly up here and you're going to go to the elk reserve in salt lake city like for whole hour sessions he would sit and tell me what is going to happen because your dad is going to do this and you guys are going to do this and it's going to be this really male bonding and i was like that's not gonna happen i can promise you it's not gonna happen i mean never mind that i'm not going to become not gay. These things that you want me to do, like this relationship with my dad, is not going to happen. Because what? He does not get on a plane and fly up, and I'm not going to go to the elk reserve with him and suddenly be not gay. I, <laughs> does he hunt? No. <laughs> do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I just, I, I don't know why, but he was, he was an elderly gentleman. Yeah. And didn't listen very much and didn't really validate much of anything of what I was saying. And so it just more and more felt like this is so 
I was so worthless. This is not happening. The one thing that he did say to me that stuck and that mattered is that he said, well, you are going to need to date someone, which you are going to, going to get married, whatever, and you are going to tell her. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> no, that is not part of the scenario. I will not be telling anybody that I'm dating. Um, but he planted that seed. So that is the one massive credit I give to him. Otherwise, pointless. Hmm. I mean, I, it was not helpful. It made me try and try and try to be something that I'm not and feel over and over and over like more of a failure and get more and more depressed because I couldn't accomplish what I was expected to do in the therapy I was going to. Did you find yourself making promises to God? <laughs> oh, God. My whole life I have made promise after promise. Like, tried to make these deals about my massive righteousness. I, I Throughout my life, and even at this time, I'd make lists of the more righteous things I was going to do. Okay, so I'm going to out my scripture reading per day to this amount of minutes. And I'm going to stay on my knees this amount of minutes. And I'm going to, like, really trying to even get specific about my deals because God was going to fix this for me and I was going to unlearn all my stuff and it's going to be all be better. Who put it into your was. head that God would fix this if you were righteous enough? Any idea? Is that, does that just naturally come as you, you associate it with sin and you know that God can take temptation away? So it just kind of naturally occurs to you? I can't remember a time somebody saying, I think that it's really the message. It's the overall message. Which is what? You... If you are righteous enough, after all that you can do, you will be saved. Right. So. So for you, it was being saved from being gay. Yeah. Yeah. After all you can do. After all you all can do. All you can do. Which is never, ever met. Because there is never a time that you can do it all. just take one more step. Can you say, I can't do any more? Right. No, because if you can say, I can't do any more, you can still use your voice, which could be used to testify. <laughs> if you're not dead or in a coma, you could do more. So mm. it can't be met. I can never be enough. I think it also, maybe it's not necessarily said, but it's almost like the only hope. If I'm not going to be gay, what other option is there except for God to change it? I mean... So maybe nobody said it, but it's sort of the, it's like the only default is some kind of magic, right? Some kind of magic about that. So would you work towards some date or month or year where you'd be like, okay, I'm going to work really super hard until next October, and then I'm going to see if it's been taken away? Yeah, I would, I can remember specifically doing that through my life with periods of fasting. Fasting? Yeah. Days and days in a row. And fasting days in a row? Well, I would never fast for more than two days in a row. So sometimes two I would days make up of like, fasting? Yeah. But sometimes I would make up like, I'm going to fast for a week, which means I'm going to fast every day till dinner. And then I will eat dinner, but as soon as dinner's over, I will fast till the next day of dinner. So kind of trying to do like a, a fast Sunday, but five days in a row kind of thing. And at the end, there will be transformation. <laughs> It didn't happen. Yeah. What was that like each time you would you would amp it up, double down, triple down, and then you get to the end? Um, I, it's probably, I think it was inc incredibly devastating for me, but I wasn't going to let it necessarily be devastating. I would downplay the devastation, like, just personally. As in, okay, that didn't work. Well, that's Probably because I did five days instead of six. Okay. I'll try better next time. Because the answer is always my fault. Always. That's the Mormonism answer from my perspective. That is what Mormonism taught me. There is nothing wrong that is not my fault. All of it is. So, because you can always do better. And you could have tried harder. And God blesses and reveals what like good things to people who do enough. So I, and I, I just clearly was not enough. 
So at the end of this reparative therapy that was not working and this year at Provo that was depressing and depressing and depressing me more, I did the one thing that I knew could work to sort of change things around because as much as I don't want to exist, I didn't want to kill myself necessarily, but that was also because if I kill myself, then I have to go to spare prison and then I'm going to be in the lost kingdom, which is not where I'm supposed to be. And I'll be a total failure. Like I was thought I was. I'm like, it's such a Mormon mindset about why I cannot even kill myself that I've got to figure out something to do. So I ran. I need to do something with my life. This is not it. I'm completely miserable. Let's go somewhere. Where? It doesn't even matter because the world was open to me. I had no ties anywhere. My sister lived in Colorado, and every time I visited her, I liked it. It was a nice place. I'll go to Colorado. This is Carrie. Yeah. So you came to Colorado? I just, because I've got to do something. So I came to Colorado. Here I came, and promptly, like, Got my energy back because we're in a fresh new place and nobody knows what's going on and I'm going to make this life work and yeah, we can do this. And I got super involved with the ward as much as I could right away and I got my own apartment and this is really good and got a job that, you know, wasn't great paying, but it was high paying enough for me as a single man and um, just at a youth treatment center because that's what you could do with a psychology degree and thought about, you know, Okay, pretty soon, one of these years, very soon, we're going to go back to grad school, and I don't know, we're just starting over. So it was pretty good. And you know, again, this hopefulness with this complete despair, this is all, I have it all through the whole story so far. It's a very, very, du- it's a great duality. Like, I'm, I feel so miserable. I feel so alone. I feel the spirit. I'm so grateful that God loves me. I wish I was enough for the love that he has for me. I mean, it's just, it's all held at the same time. I'm saying it as though it's back and forth. It wasn't. It really was all together at the same time with me trying to make it back and forth, me trying to make everything bad go away with everything good. So, ugh. Then I moved here, and then I met Heather. 